Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to present our speaker for today, Mark Rogoff from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Um, he is the Lead Environmental Education Specialist at the New Jersey DEP. He is a former classroom teacher and museum educator and currently serves on the Climate Change Education Thought Leader Committee, the New Jersey Commission on Environmental Education, the Executive Board of the New Jersey Earth Science Teachers Association, and have served as a consultant to the National Wildlife Federation, NASA, the US EPA, the American Museum of Natural History, Liberty Science Center, and the New Jersey chapter of the United States Green Building Council. So thank you so much, Mark, for speaking to us today. Um, before, we, before we jump into the presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, this is going to be a very interactive uh, program today. So we encourage your participation throughout the program using the chat feature. Uh, Mark is going to kind of let the audience decide where the program goes. So if there's a topic or something that's interesting to you that you see on the screen, or if there's something you want to learn more about, um, it's very interactive. So please flood the chat with what you would like to see, what you would like to hear. And if you have any questions, um, we will certainly address them and you can use them using the Q&A button or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Uh, Mark has provided me with a, a handout that I will be sharing in the chat once we get underway. You'll be able to download the handout directly from the chat. If you have any problems, don't worry. I will also send it in a follow-up email so that you'll be able to have it there as well. Uh, at the end of the program, we ask that you please complete the survey that pops up. Um, we always love hearing your, your feedback, so if you do have time, we, we greatly appreciate that. And if you're looking for more information about how you can help the environment, which is kind of the motif um, for this presentation, you can check out the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's website at the, uh, the web address on the screen there, and they have a whole host of resources that, that are available for you. So one last thing before we jump in, I just want to do a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. Um, first and foremost, in the bottom left, you have your audio settings. So in case you are running into any audio issues, you can check there first. You always have the option also to call into the program that you got with your registration confirmation email. Um, at any point during the program, there is a raise hand button in the center. You can hit that. That'll alert me. I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to resolve any of the problems that you are having. And as I mentioned, for questions, you can use the Q&A or the chat button. But today we're going to encourage you to participate using the chat button. And you'll see in a moment once Mark gets underway on how we're looking for your participation. So that is everything that I have for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, I see we have a, a 13 participants. And as Andrew said, please use the chat. You, could, you don't have to give your name. Uh, I think that does it for you, but please just say greetings and where you are from so that I can get a good idea of the audience and how best to uh, approach these uh, questions that you may have. Um, the presentation, and that's up on the screen now, right, Andrew? Um, <laughs> not yet. You, you have to share. I thought I. I did have the share. Okay. I am sharing. There it is. Okay. All right. The presentation is called, and I don't have my uh, chat. Where's chat? So I can see chat. I want to see chat. So we've got ah, New Egypt. Yardville, Lambertville, East Brunswick, Robbinsville. A lot of places that end in Ville. Welcome. Uh, this presentation is audience driven. So 
a show of hands and comments on the chat would be very helpful to me uh, in, in pro pro program the, as going through the presentation. It is called Environmental Protection, What You Can Do, and it deals with your specific habits that most people have and share. And uh, depending upon the age of the audience, uh, there are easy ways to modify those habits, especially if you're young. If you're older, like myself, your habits are pretty much set in stone and very difficult to, uh, to modify because you've got a, many years of doing the same thing over and over and over again. And many people's habits are good for the environment and others are not so good for the environment. When I first started doing this presentation, which was about 2003, 2004, my commissioner had said, the important thing is to let people know what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Uh, so this should be called, uh, be called what you can do, yes and no. And as most people are aware, when you tell an audience, especially of children, not to do something, that's the first thing they wanna do. And by saying no to somebody, don't ever do this, I have turned them off to what the rest of my presentation is supposed to be, which is a positive outlook on environmental protection. So we call this more or less. And the reason why is because what I'm looking for is habits that you have that are good for the environment and have beneficial effect on the environment. So I want you to do more of those. The ones that are not so good for the environment or can, are detrimental, I want you to do less of. I'm not going to tell you to stop doing it. I'm just going to say that the less you do, the better off the environment is going to be. Because there are habits, even I have, that I know are not that environmentally friendly, but I don't want to give up doing it. And that's pretty much the same with many people. They have something they enjoy doing. And even though it may not be that beneficial to the environment or detrimental to the environment, I can do less of them. And it's not that hard a challenge. So basically, there are nine subjects that when we put this presentation together at the Department of Environmental Protection, we came up with that pretty much covered many of the different aspects of things that happen in our daily lives. We all breathe air. We have, we drink water or use water. Actually, it is the most used substance on the planet for people. Um, so it's not a solid. I mean, it's, it can be a solid, it can be a liquid, it can be gas. But in any case, whatever the state of matter happens to be, we use more water than anything else. When it comes to solids, the surprising answer is actually the thing we use the most, even more than metals or plastic or wood, is sand. But water is the most used material we've, we, we use. We also use a lot of energy, which we can talk, talk about. We travel. I happen to have flown down to North Carolina just last week, so I know that my carbon footprint right now is pretty bad, but uh, I didn't have any other way to get there, and it was necessary for me to be there. We have home care, which can be in your house or your apartment or condominium or nursing home, whatever it happens to be. Waste, lawn care, if you happen to have one. Lifestyle, and lastly on this list, which is in the center there, climate change. Climate change is a major issue now, and many people claim that it is the most important issue of the day. That Anything we do has to be climate change related in terms of our actions and our impacts. Uh, I say that climate change is not the most dangerous thing that we deal with uh, that affects the environment. The biggest impact that we can have on the environment is if we are ignorant and apathetic to it. If we are aware of what's going on and we, are, we care about what's going on, then all of these things that I'm gonna be speaking about are something that we can act on. And when we go through this presentation, you will see things that we consider the mores and what we consider the lesses. My challenge to people is to pick a more or a less, maybe weekly, and you'll have a chart, you'll have the list that uh, Andrew has available, 
And if you're doing something that's good for the environment, take it out of the more list and continue to do it, do more of it. If there's something that's bad for the environment or detrimental, pick one of the lesses and start to do less of that. After a week, if that's comfortable with, with, with you, pick another one and add that to your habitual repertoire. And the more that you add to your list of things that you can do or not do for the environment, the more impact you're going to have. If you try something that doesn't work for you, just pick something else. Every little bit, if you remember, every little bit helps. So what I ask of you now as uh, through the chat is to choose one of these nine topics that means something to you that you would like to know a little bit more about in terms of what you can do. So first chat person to respond gets the gets the square. Home care. I like it. So what you're going to see now are two arrows, one that points up and one that points down. In those two arrows are lists of mores. We'll get to energy use next and lawn care. You got the order here now. The ones that point up are things that we, I would like, or the department would like people to do more of. And the things that are in the down arrow are the ones that less of. Everybody can read. So take a look over this list. And if there's something that doesn't make sense to you or something you'd like to know more about, let me know in the chat. My objective here is to actually give you an incentive. Incentives are very difficult to come up with when it comes to changing habits. It takes a long time for people to change their habits. Children, it's a lot easier because they haven't had their habits set in stone. But uh, adults, adults are harder to change their habits. I have found during working with groups that there are two things that actually will make a, an adult seriously think about changing their habits. Uh, and surprisingly, they may not be what you expect initially. The most common response is our health. Well, if our health was really that important to people, nobody would be smoking. Um, people would avoid driving and uh, we would be a little more, well, health is not an issue often that makes people change their habits very quickly. The ones that I have found that are the most effective, and I don't know if anybody wants to take a, ch a shot at popping what they think is in the chat, but uh, I'll give you a moment. I'll read what this says here. What about the use of essential oils as air fresheners? Um, essential oils as air fresheners are, apps, are, are great and uh, are, are definitely something that can be used and, and do not have a detrimental effect on the environment. Uh, can I elaborate on good cleaning products versus bad? Sure. Uh, anybody yet think of something that makes people change their habits? I'll give you my two examples. Uh, one is if you're going to save time. And the other one is if you're going to save money. And those two usually have a very quick impact on people. Uh, so what I'll do is try to show you when I point out these changes that I'm asking people to make to be more environmentally friendly, how it will affect, it will affect your watch and your wallet. Green cleaners, for example, as it says here, can I elaborate on good or bad? The more chemicals that are, at, that are involved in your cleaners, the more environmental damage it can cause. Uh, when we look at green cleaners, we're referring to methods and products that are environmentally friendly uh, and uh, preserve human health and, and environmental quality. Uh, green cleaning techniques and products avoid the use of chemically reactive and toxic cleanings products 
which contain, can contain toxic chemicals, uh, volatile organic chemicals, uh, which can also lead to respiratory and dermatological problems. Uh, green cleaning is a way to describe the way residents and industrial cleaning products are manufactured, produced, and distributed. If it's environmentally friendly and the products are, let's say, biodegradable, then the term green or eco-friendly can be, can be utilized on the, on the containers. Uh, it's basically looking at a behavioral as well as uh, healthy environmentally friendly products. And uh, many of these products are listed on uh, green wiki pro, uh, websites, as well as on the DEP's website. These uh, products um, can also be uh, pr purchased a lot cheaper than many of the household chemicals that we commonly use. Uh, some simple things like lemon juice, vinegar, baking soda, um, and elbow grease are going to clean as effectively as some of the more dangerous or environmentally unfriendly products that are out there. Most supermarkets do offer these products. Uh, many of them, if you go into supermarkets, you can usually find them on end caps instead of down the main aisles. And uh, they usually run equivalent to the products, pr pr uh, prices on the products. Here, it may take a little more time for things to work, uh, but depending upon the amount of energy you're putting in. So one example that is not listed here is um, a chemical, I'm not sorry, a product that is used to clean toilets that I have found quite effective and most people are quite surprised. And it's uh, cherry high C powder. Uh, you pour that into your toilet, you let it sit, and it does a really good job of breaking up the materials that are along inside the, the toilet bowl, and then a brush just sweep them all out. Another thing to get um, uh, pots and pans clean is to rub some ketchup onto your sponge and then wipe it gently onto, the pro onto your pots and pans, let it sit for a little while. Ketchup is high in vinegar. Vinegar is very good at removing stains from these products. And they are definitely not dangerous to the environment. Um, and, and you can lick them clean if you want to afterwards. Oh, don't try that, actually. Is there anything else on the home care listing here that you might have questions about that? Okay, we can go to the next product then. I mean, the next section then, which would be energy use. We are an extremely uh, energy, we, we use a lot of energy in the United States. We use more than any other country right now in the world. Uh, China's catching up with us, uh, but uh, we, we use a tremendous amount of energy. And the amount that we use and the current methods of using it is not sustainable. There are other alternatives, but uh, at this point, our infrastructure does not allow them to sort of take over. Uh, there are alternatives such as solar, uh, wind. Here in New Jersey, we can use tidal. less meat. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. That's good. And these other energy sources are um, not as easy to access because we don't have the infrastructure yet to put them into 100% effectiveness. The uh, most environmentally friendly, surprisingly, source of energy that we use currently, which gives off no carbon dioxide is nuclear, but it has its own issues. Uh, if we were to go to solar, we would need to set up large solar panels uh, with large batteries that would store the energy because it's not always sunny out. We could go to wave and tidal 
energy as well, and we intend to do so in, uh, in some respect, as well as wind. But our major products that we use to produce energy are, of course, coal and oil, and uh, even electric vehicles. Uh, they claim that they are more environmentally friendly. Yes, they are more environmentally friendly after they're produced. But in the production of these, uh, of these cars, these vehicles, the environmental damages are actually more than the equivalent production of a gasoline vehicle. In the long run, however, remember electric vehicles still need electricity and unless they're being powered by solar or other alternative energy forms, they're being powered by coal. And that is what's being used to generate the electricity. So at this point, we still don't have the best, most effective methods used to be as energy efficient as possible. Over time, this will change as more incentives are out there for the production of these materials, as well as more people are willing to actually go out and buy them. There are other methods that can be utilized. I can speak about them in other, when we get to other slides. Is there anything on this page for energy use that you might have a question about? or like to know more about, or even know how this can affect your watch and your wallet. Vampire voltage. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is vampire voltage. It's a negative, it's not good for the environment, and I can tell you a little bit about it as well. Vampire voltage re re refers to voltage that goes to equipment that you think is turned off. Um, when in fact, it's actually still on and sucking electricity as a vampire would suck blood. So one example is for vampire voltage is a cable television set or uh, your computer. If you leave, if you just turn the monitor off, you know that the power is still on. If your t television set, you turn the monitor off, the TV is actually still on. Even if you hit the power on the television set, it's still on, it's dropped its electricity use by about 75%, but it still has electric use. You can actually test these. Many libraries across the state have kilowatts that uh, it's a little device right over here. I don't know if you can see my arrow, right over there, kilowatt, which actually measures the electricity being used. And by plugging it in and plugging in the unit that you want to test, it tells you how much electricity is being used when, the, when, the, when it's on and when it's off. And remember that unless you have a manual walk up to the TV and turn the channels remote by, by yourself with your hand, the room, it has a remote. And there has to be a sensor in the machine, in the television set, that knows, picks up the signal from the remote to tell it to turn on or turn off. So that sensor is always on. And so it's always using electricity. And that's vampire voltage. Another example is a microwave oven. You may use your microwave oven for maybe a few minutes each day to, to cook some food or at least to heat the water in the food. Um, but the microwave is always on. Uh, one example of that fact is it always has a clock. Almost every microwave has a clock on them. The clock is always on. And if you actually look at the voltage that it takes during, let's say, the three minutes that you cook something for the entire day uh, and compare it to the 24 hours that the clock is on, you're actually probably paying more for keeping the clock going than actually cooking the food. Uh, and you can actually use a, a kilowatt to determine that. So the best way to make sure that the power is off on something is to plug it into a power strip and turn the power strip off. It doesn't always work the way you want because then your remote won't work, but your TV will definitely be off. 
uh, if you're going away for long periods of time, make sure that you do turn off as much as possible, save electricity. Don't turn off your refrigerator or your freezer. I did that once accidentally when I went away on a cruise, came back and saved $40 in electricity and lost $400 worth of food. So that wasn't worth it. Someone asked about the three second rule. The three second rule is quite simple. When you drop food on the floor, you know that you can eat it if it's, a, if it's there less than three set. set. No, wait a minute. That's a five second rule. Oh, the three second rules, if you're leaving a room for any more than three seconds, turn off the lights. And in most cases, you're not going to be leaving the room for under three seconds. Um, and no matter what type of lights you have, whether they're incandescent, uh, fluorescent, LED, uh, many years ago, a, a television show called Mythbusters showed that by turning off the lights after three, if you're gonna be out for more than three seconds, or even if you're out for only three seconds, turning them back on again, the spike in electricity does not make a difference. You're going to save electricity by turning off the lights. So turning them on and off within a three second period is environmentally friendly. If you're going to leave a room, turn off the lights, unless somebody else is in there. I habitually turn lights off when I leave a room, which is difficult in my office when I leave the restroom because usually there are people still in there and I get a lot of nasty comments. I've pretty much learned not to do that anymore. Any other questions on energy use? Well, the next one was in lawn care. Not everybody has a lawn. Uh, some people are very specific about what they want their lawn to look like if you have one. Some people like myself, I really don't care what my lawn looks like as long as it is not getting me any nasty comments. Um, I try not to uh, mow frequently. I think it's rather odd that people in this country spend billions of dollars to get their grass to grow, only to cut it when it actually does grow and then spend more to get it to grow some more. And then once it starts to grow to cut it again. Uh, it just seems repetitive and a waste of time and money. Um, however, uh, there are other issues that when, when it comes to lawn care that we can deal with. Does anybody have any comments or questions about what's listed here on this page? If not, I can, okay, zero escape. Uh, I had a feeling people would ask about that. Usually, I get a few that are almost common, uh, always asked about. Xeriscaping refers to uh, landscaping with plants that are native to the area, drought tolerant. It's also known as smartscaping. And native plants are plants that have been in the area for long periods of time. They have been uh, li living and growing in New Jersey for generations and generations. What we call these natives, when a group of plants come into an area that are not generally associated with that area, those are non-native. That doesn't mean that it's bad for the environment. Some, however, can be, uh, we use the term aggressive by taking up the space that native plants would be and pushing those species away. We know we refer to those as, um, uh, invasives, forgot the word for a second there. And invasive species are, uh, uh, we have a group of people in the state that go out and, and they study invasives and they try to get rid of them. Invasive species that are typical for New Jersey include plants such as the purple, purple loosestrife, uh, animals such as the Asian longhorn beetle and the um, Uh, forgot it again, but I'll know I'll remember it in, in a few moments. 
But these species are, we encourage people to actually um, rid, rid the areas of these species. With the coming of climate change issues such as warming in the area, a lot of species from further south will be moving northward as the temperatures increase. And so they will be the new incoming native species even though they're not native to the area, they're native to those climates and those habitats. Uh, is there a list of species to be rid of? Yes, we have a list of, of natives and invasive species on the DEP's website. You can also go to the Native Plant Society of New Jersey and see listings of the native plants and many of the species that are considered invasives. Uh, they also encourage people to, to not grow non-natives in your property, although, as I said, there are lessons that you won't want to do. Uh, my wife loves certain plants that she definitely wants growing on our property. They are not native, but they are also not invasive. So I don't have a, I don't have a problem with them. I plant for myself, you know, in our yard, I plant uh, native only, but I've strayed once in a while. Okay, is there a substitute ground cover that does, doesn't does harbor ticks when not mowed? Uh, unfortunately, my answer of, of what I'm aware of, the answer is no. Uh, is no. Uh, ticks are nat native to this area and are very um, re resilient to pretty much any change. It's very difficult to stop them. Uh, you can wear proper clothing, you can tuck your pants into your socks if you're going to be walking outside in an area where you will find ticks uh, and check yourself afterwards always. There are uh, There is little that can be done to really stop the, uh, where ticks live. There are native plants that you can grow on your property that are less uh, commonly have uh, ticks, uh, for example, lower, uh, they have lower, they don't grow so high. I hate herbicides, but have neighbors who despise the grass growing in the driveway cracks. Tried to flame weeder, but did not find it very effective. Maybe I'm not using it properly. Uh, herbicides are definitely uh, something that's not good for the environment and have long lasting detrimental effects. I was just about to say thank you, uh, uh, Teresa. Vinegar works great. Uh, you can also uh, use uh, dish soap and pour that onto areas where you find these plants uh, growing in the cracks, and it, it does help. You can also pull the weeds out as best you can and then put in a caulking that would block their access to light. But yes, herbicides, try to avoid any herbicides that are, um, that are out there. They've gotten better. Uh, chemicals that are used in fertilizers and herbicides have gotten better as new products, uh, as, as the requirements for these products have gotten more stringent. A lot of companies are very quick to change their formulas. New Jersey was the, was one of the places that first started changing um, pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers, and their requirements were stricter than most other states. But uh, instead of, for example, the, some of these companies that had decided to uh, change their formulas to match New Jersey realized that uh, you can't make a product specific for Jersey. It's got to be specific. It's got to be for the entire country, or they're going to lose. Pro it's going to be more expensive. So many of these companies lowered the percentage of different chemicals uh, just because New Jersey changed their rules, and the rest of the country benefited from it. But yes, there are natural or alternatives, and many of them. All you need to do is just Google natural alternatives. Different types of grasses, sure. All right, 
When we refer to native grasses, as I've said before, they're grasses that have been here for a long time. Grass is an extremely um, resilient plant. There are many different types of grasses growing, uh, ranging from the most common one we use in our lawns, Kentucky bluegrass, to uh, bamboo, which is a type of grass. Grass, different than most other plants, grows from the top up, um, where most plants grow from the bottom up. So if you crop the top of a grass, it'll continue to grow because that top point, wherever it has been cut, will start to grow from that point. Other plants, if you cut the bottom off, uh, they're going to die. But grasses have evolved so that they could be browsed and grazed, and uh, they still come back strong and fresh. And these are examples of New Jersey's native grasses here. And if you look at the picture carefully, although it may be difficult to read what it says, you can see quite clearly that the roots of these grasses go down equally or deeper and longer than the stems and flowers of these types of grasses, especially uh, uh, the ones on the end here and here and here. So the roots are great at reaching down for the deep water sources and the mineral sources. So if you have a drought and the water table drops down, these roots can still reach down to the water. So they're what we call drought resi resistant. They can survive for long periods without water, as well as reach down to get the water that is available to them. Uh, those roots also hold the soil in place and uh, prevent erosion. The one, one, the one picture here that I have not put on this is actually the most commonly purchased grass in, in, in the country, which is actually not native, but I have a picture of it here that I can show you. And that's Kentucky bluegrass. Um, notice that the roots go down practically not at all. So Kentucky bluegrass is not very good at resisting erosion. It is not good at reaching down to get water. So it's not drought resistant. It needs to be watered very frequently. Uh, the truth of the matter is it's not from Kentucky and it's not blue. The flowers are if you let it grow, but the grass itself is green and it's from England. And uh, they don't call it British green grass because people like to think they're buying American and Kentucky bluegrass sounds as, as American as apple pie. So you buy your Kentucky bluegrass, but you're being tricked into thinking that it's something that should be there. And in reality, it shouldn't. And uh, it shouldn't be grown on your lawns. There are lots of other different types of grasses. You can contact the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. They have a listing of native grasses. They also have a listing of what these grasses are resistant to, as well as uh, how good they are under foot traffic. So you can grow these other types of grasses. I personally grow tall fescue, uh, blue fescue, and, um, and blue ryegrass in my yard. They're all native to New Jersey. Uh, they get a lot of uh, foot traffic. I have children as well as myself. Uh, I don't mow frequently. I don't water at all. Uh, and my grass is as green as my neighbor's. It doesn't have the no weeds whatsoever as, as my neighbor next door does, but I also don't spend four to six thousand dollars a year to keep it that way. Alrighty, and the next topic. Well, long care was the last one requested. So any other questions about long care here? Waste, let's go to waste. I want everybody to remember that no matter how much you look on Google Earth, uh, how, much, how much time you're gonna spend, you are not going to find a place called the way. So anything that you throw away isn't going to one specific place on the map I've looked, I even put together, I, I, I used Google Earth to create a little 
picture of a town called away. Uh, and uh, in this, in the PowerPoint, the town of away, the town gets buried in waste until the, it finally collapses into a giant sinkhole. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of kid sound effects in it, but uh, there is no place called away. Everything that we discard has to go somewhere. And in many cases, it's going to stay there for years, decades, centuries, millennia. And it doesn't have to be that way. So if you look at this list listing here of ups and downs, mores or lesses from waste, you can see some of the things that are positive and some of the things that are negative. And if anybody has any questions about these issues, about what's listed here, please let me know. I will point out one thing, uh, if, if you don't, uh, I have a Keurig uh, and I do not use these coffee pods. And when I do, I do something very particular with them. There are lots of different, the person who invented the Keurig uh, regrets it deeply. In, in an interview, he said he can't stand the fact that people have thrown away as, uh, enough Keurig pods to circle the world multiple times if you put them end to end. Uh, and that just keeps going and going and going as more people keep buying these coffee pods. If you use a reusable one, you're not only going to save yourself uh, a lot of money, but you're also going to save the world a lot of waste that in many cases winds up in a landfill. Most of the time, these products are, are made of in, in somewhat recyclable material as well. If you take your coffee pot after you're done with it and peel off the aluminum plastic cover that's on top and discard that, the rest, the grounds, can be used, and even the paper, if it's a paper filter, can be thrown into a compost bin and can be used for compost. The plastic is often the same type of plastic used to make milk bottles and can be recycled. Many of them do not list the number on them when it comes to the recycling number. So you can check with your community and your recycling, your local recycling center, to see if they do accept the coffee pot plastic, but it has to be cleaned of any materials inside. My community does take them. So if I do use these coffee pots, the pre-filled ones, I make sure that I recycle everything with the exception of the, the aluminum and plastic, I mean, the, the foil and plastic top, which is discarded. But by using the re replaceable, the refillable ones, you're not, you, you can also, compost the grounds, which I do. So my backyard has a nice coffee smell to it. And uh, it costs about $10 to buy a pack of four of the coffee pod fill, uh, refillables, but you're gonna save a lot more than that compared to looking at the product you're getting. So for example, if you buy your traditional coffee in a, let's say Dunkin' Donuts or one of the supermarket brands, or even one of the, uh, the name brands, you're going to be spending probably 15 to 30 cents per cup. When if you buy the Keurigs in a small six pack, you're looking at a dollar 50 or so up, up, uh, per cup. Uh, if you buy them in the mel mel multi packs or the family packs, they're still more expensive than refilling with your favorite ground coffee. Any other questions in terms of waste? I will let you know that New Jersey does a pretty good job of recycling. If you compare New Jersey to a lot of other states, we are probably in the top 10 when it comes to recycling. Uh, unfortunately, even the top 10 is not a very good number. And uh, there's massive rooms for improvement. We did take a good step in that direction by recently creating a law for uh, single-use plastics to not be available. Um, 
and we'll all deal with the uh, impacts of that by bringing bags to the supermarkets uh, and expecting not to get bags when when you unfortunately don't have one. So we are working to ensure that our plastic use goes down. Remember, plastics in most cases are not they are not biodegradable. They're going to be around for millennia, centuries, and any piece of plastic that's ever been made in history is still around today, uh, going back to the first types of plastics that were created. Um, I don't know the date. If anybody does, please feel free to share it. Uh, we do throw away a lot. We do waste a lot. Uh, one of the biggest wastes that uh, we have in New Jersey is uneaten food waste. Uh, so there are different things that you can do to ensure that you're not throwing away food. Uh, I wish that uh, my house was really, really good at that, but uh, we do waste a lot of food. The average American throws away about four pounds of waste every single day. The average New Jersey person throws away six and a half pounds of waste every day. Um, Georgia is eight and a quarter pounds every day. So we do throw away a lot. Uh, if it's not taken proper care of in terms of recycling, that's a lot going into a landfill. Uh, and if you're thinking about what less waste, don't just think about where you're throwing something away, think about where you're getting it in the first place. A lot of products are packaged in so much that you're actually getting less material for what you're buying than the amount of material that makes up the packaging. Uh, an example, I, I have children, they're adults now, but one example was any anytime a Marvel movie came out, my son wanted the action figure that went along with that uh, movie. So Captain America, Iron Man and the rest. And uh, the packaging that makes up the, pro the, the material that Iron Man little figure is sitting in consists of a large piece of cardboard, lots of plastic, uh, and wired hold uh, the figure in, in place or a rubber band. Uh, the, everything there can be reused. The plastic is actually the same plastic as soda bottles and can be recycled even though it doesn't say two on it. It's the same thing. Uh, the cardboard can be recycled and the rubber bands can be used as well. Uh, Usually my son would break the Iron Man figure within a couple of weeks and ask for a new one, um, but he had to go in the garbage. Uh, any suggestions for reducing kitty litter waste? There are natural products that are out there. I believe that in many cases, they're a little more expensive than uh, the, uh, the non-natural products. If you feed your kitty less, it's going to waste less. That's not a serious answer. Uh, there are some uses for the natural clays if, uh, that some, some people have issues with, but a natural clay clump uh, that has been used for urine from a cat can actually be placed around plants that you want to keep squirrels and other rodents away. And they're very effective at that because the, the, the rodents will smell a predator and they won't go near the plants. Um, it's, it's good for, yeah. Yeah, don't use the feces, but uh, if, if you can use the urine soaked materials. Uh, forgive me for sure. Oh, okay, I'm going to read this here. Uh, you should, but why are plastics three and higher not recyclable anymore in most towns? Uh, separating the plastics is an expensive process. Uh, and uh, there was a time in the past that uh, much of our recycled material was being purchased by other co countries. Cardboard was uh, purchased in Canada. Canada would purchase a tremendous amount of recycled cardboard from the United States. And China was buying up a tremendous amount of our plastics. China has stopped buying our plastics. So the money that was coming from these purchases is now gone. And a lot of, a, a lot of, com a lot of recycling companies that were making profits from selling to, to China are now, it's costing them more. And so they're limiting a lot of the plastics that they now accept. 
So three and four and five, uh, a lot of those others, they're now ta not taking them because there's no market for them. Uh, and we know that our economy is market driven. And if there's no market for it, there's nothing much that they can do with it except for eventually winding up in a landfill. So many towns don't use, don't take those numbers anymore because there's no infrastructure that allows them to do so and make, make some money. There are places that will accept these products. Uh, somebody just mentioned TerraCycle. Um, TerraCycle does use a lot of materials that are very difficult to recycle. For example, the boxes that juices come in are multi-layered with cardboard and plastics. And so it's very difficult to recycle that, um, to make new products out of that, because it's a mixture of different things that are very hard to separate. TerraCycle has a very good way of doing it. They don't actually separate the material. They just utilize it to make new products in the form that it's in. So you can make a, uh, um, for, uh, for example, a pocketbook out of juice boxes and it still has the juice box labels on it, but it's now a pocketbook. Let me see some other questions here. Uh, pellet, yes, okay. Clumping litter. Yes, you do use much less that way that goes into the garbage. Are some coffee pods biodegradable? Uh, if I haven't seen any that say that yet, there may be products. I don't drink, I, since I don't buy the coffee pods myself um, and, I, and I use the refillables, I haven't seen coffee pods that say they're biodegradable. I personally don't trust most of the companies that say their plastics are biodegradable because what they biodegrade down into are just smaller pieces of plastic uh, and the microplastics. If they are made out of a bioplastic, then they probably are biodegradable, but they might cost a little more at this point because bioplastics are more expensive to produce and are not at, uh, on the market as much. But if people insist on buying bioplastics and are willing to, to actually do so, they'll be more made. I mean, it is, we are a market-driven economy. Uh, couldn't municipalities subsidize the costs for TerraCycle for its boxes? I imagine that if enough people were to say so, they would do so. Uh, there are probably groups that are already doing so. Uh, contact TerraCycle and ask them if any municipalities are doing so and find out how you can do that. Uh, also contact your own municipalities, environmental organizations, their environmental commission, their, sh their shade tree commissions, which usually have the same people on them, uh, to try to help promote that. Uh, most municipalities do have a shade tree or environmental commission. If, if yours do, does not, contact the group called ANJEC, the Association of of uh, New Jersey Environmental Commissions and see if you can start one yourself. Okay, let's see. I miss any questions. All right, then I'm going to go on and open it up to the next suggestion. Air. We all breathe it. We know that the composition of air has been changing. Um, most people remember that 78% of our air is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen. And the remaining 1% consists of carbon dioxide, the noble gases, uh, water vapor, a few other chemicals. And unfortunately, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, the carbon dioxide levels have been rising more than naturally. The, naturally, carbon dioxide does rise and fluctuate. 
It does go up after examples, volcanic eruptions. Uh, much of the carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean, uh, creating carbonic acids in the ocean, uh, but not a tremendous amount. So the oceans have remained pretty stable in terms of pH for millennia. Uh, the temperature has gone up due to carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. It is a natural process, climate change. Uh, however, the natural process has been increased. Uh, we're speeding it up. Mentioning this, I haven't gotten to climate change. Don't know if we will in the next few minutes. But uh, our contributions to our atmosphere in terms of carbon dioxide has gone up considerably. So anytime that you can do something that reduces the amount of carbon dioxide that is being released is going to be a beneficial thing for the environment. So are there any questions here uh, about the two arrows? And I will point out the first one says trees. Yes, planting new trees is a good way to lower the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But the truth of the matter is the most photosynthesis that occurs on our planet has nothing to do with trees. It has to do with the first two or three inches of the oceans where phytoplankton or microscopic plant material are pulling in the carbon dioxide and creating oxygen. More of this process occurs in the oceans than on any land mass on the planet. So planting trees is great, but not polluting the ocean, it, not polluting the ocean is even better. Any questions here? All right, Andrew, how much time do we have? Um, give a few more minutes. Okay. Um, if that's the case, I'm gonna shoot back to uh, the main here. If there, are there any questions about something we may not have covered yet in terms, does anybody wanna quickly give a shot for one of these? Shout out to one of these. If not, then I have a challenge for, okay. Is there a second rule for when you turn your car off at a drive up window, pharmacy, fast food? A second rule. Okay, how many seconds? Um, I don't know if Mythbusters has done a study on how much gasoline is used when you turn your car on and off. I would assume that anytime you turn your car off, it's going to be saving uh, you some gasoline instead of idling. New Jersey has a law that you cannot idle for uh, more than a few minutes, uh, unless of course you have, uh, for example, an emergency vehicle or a vehicle that has to power uh, something else. Uh, so repair machinery. Uh, but uh, what, I, what I think one of the worst uh, things to do is idling to warm up your car. I believe, I have that here. When your car is cold, like you, um, if it's cold out, turning your car on and idling is like shivering. You're going, it's just standing there, vibrating, using energy, and not really getting much warmer. The most effective way to warm up a body when it is cold is to exercise it, to move. So if your car is sitting there idling, it's just shivering in the cold. Drive it. It warms up faster and warms you up faster and saves you gasoline, time, and money. Glad I got that in. Now, how about a test? Anybody up for a test? No response, so I'm giving it to you anyway. All right, you've seen the examples of mores and lesses in this presentation. You know that the mores are things we want you to do more of because that's more environmentally friendly. The lesses you want me to do less of because that would be more environmentally friendly. If you understand those, concepts. You should be able to tell me 
for example, bulk purchasing. Would you consider that a more or a less? And give your reasons. I have no prizes for the for people who get it right, except my long-lasting admiration and the fact that you can say, I got it. Okay, so we have two people who have said more because it's less packaging, especially if you bring your own bags and more, less packaging. You're correct. Less driving to pick up, more. Can anybody give me an example of how this could be a less? More saves gas. If you buy too much and waste, if you waste the product because you didn't use it, if you end up throwing out extra uneaten food. All right. To me, this means now you've been paying attention and you know what you're talking about. Every single one of these that's listed here can be considered a yes, a more, or a less, depending upon the description that has been given and the reasoning behind it. So you can see why I consider this a test. These are open-ended and make you think. And from what I see here, looks like everybody's thinking pretty well. I want to thank you for letting me have this hour to present to you. I prefer to do things in person and live. Uh, we still will do so. Uh, we are doing that. The department is sending out people. And so if you do ever have a request for a speaker, or you're doing a community event and you would like someone to come and present on materials such as so as such as this, please feel to contact me. Feel free to contact me directly. Um, my name is Mark Rogoff. My email address is MARC. I can write that down here. Everybody, to everybody, let me do that. We do have a speaker program, and on that speaker program page online, you can find listings of some of our more commonly requested presentations, as well as an open-ended uh, series that you can request something specific that's more to what your audience might be looking for if you're a specific type of audience. Thank you again, and I hope everybody enjoys the remainder of their week, and everybody had a good Memorial Day. When are off-road vehicles a more? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, there are a lot of issues when it comes to off-road vehicles in the state. Uh, a lot of people really enjoy utilizing them. I guess driving to a local place to use your off-road vehicle would be considered a more uh, if it's not a local place and you have to drive very far away to get to use your off-road vehicle. Unfortunately, the when it comes to places that are open to off-road vehicles. Uh, we're currently reviewing a lot of issues now. There used to be some places at state parks that allowed for off-road vehicles. Some of those have closed because people are not being respectful of the parks uh, or they're breaking the rules when it comes to having proper materials to use, for example, no helmets or, or other. I, I am not the one I am not an expert on off-road vehicles. Uh, I've driven one once or twice, uh, but uh, I can, at least if you do contact me, I can put you through to the people who are working on those issues now. I hope that helped your uh, answered your question, Jeanette. Alrighty, well, thank you so much, Mark, for speaking to us today. I'm gonna Fantastic. unshare, I think. <laughs> That's okay. I'll figure out how to do that. Stop share. Okay. So, so yes. we, we still have some some people. Yeah, but uh, I think we can go ahead and, and, and end it there. It was a fantastic presentation. Was we, th this was re recorded? Yes. And so it will be downloadable. Yep. Yep. I will and, send a link to everybody. And again, as I said earlier, uh, my email is always open 
<laughs> please feel free to contact me if you have further questions. Uh, I can either answer them myself or find the best people to do so for you. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Hope you found it. Uh as informative as I did, and I see according to the chat, um, a lot of people are, are thanking you for this. So you did a great service, Mark, um, and everybody enjoy your week.